Uh, well, Kenan suggested that uh, each of us spend 10 minutes describing the state of science today. And so I aptly titled my first slide, The Way We've Always Done Things. And in the 10 minutes I have, I can really only cover a few ideas. But I thought I'd go over three things that I think are uh, symptoms or phenomena that we're all familiar with that we take for granted and then cast each in a slightly new light. So we'll start with this uh, policy discussion that's been going on for at least 20 years about whether there are more jobs than graduates or more graduates than jobs. And if you've worked in the policy community, you will have seen this over and over again analyzed uh, 10 different ways. And if uh, Lindsay Lowell's here, he'll give uh, the latest spin on that argument. But having looked at the data for eight years myself uh, in gory depth, I think I've come to the conclusion that at least part of our problem is that we graduate people from our universities uh, with degrees like, or names or titles like chemist or biologist or electrical engineer. And meanwhile, there are companies hiring people with names like chemist or biologist or electrical engineer. Um, but how did come that went backwards? Okay, that's strange. Um, but in fact, uh, we are producing apples. Industry is hiring oranges, but the problem is they call them apples. So we think it's an apples to apples comparison, but it's really an apples to oranges comparison. And in order to illustrate this point, I'm going to take a field that's slightly off center from uh, science and engineering because it's a, a briefer example, an easier one to grasp. But uh, after I get off the podium, we can discuss some of the other fields. But this field is uh, called computational finance, also known as quantitative finance or financial engineering. It is the discipline of using numerical methods and applying them to financial instruments. So you can predict things that financial instruments will do. It is a very pop suddenly popular field um, it, among universities. There are now over 100 programs in which you can get your degree in computational finance or financial engineering. The starting salaries are very impressive, as you'll see. Uh, and so this is an area where universities have rushed to meet the market. However, um, I collected these data on the right from five of the top ten universities uh, as ranked in this field uh, in terms of the current ability of their graduates to get jobs. And the unemployment rate uh, of their graduates is currently hovering um, around 11.5%. Uh, it's interesting because the current unemployment rate over the past year averaged, and doesn't vary very much over the last year, for a college graduate, vanilla degree, um, is about 5%. So here we are with a field um, that's supposedly very hot. We're producing lots of graduates in it, and still their chances of being unemployed are twice that of the average college-educated public. So you would say that, well, maybe this is a field where there are jo uh, graduates in excess of jobs. But meanwhile, if you go to look at the job advertisements, what you see are indications that employers are desperate for these graduates, okay? So I went to quantjobs.com over the, uh, and these jobs have been posted for at least a couple of weeks now. So we see from the first listing that they're looking for a PhD from a well-regarded university. We don't really care which one. In some field, physics, computer science, machine learning, signal processing, computer vision, statistics, economics, operations, research, just anything. Just, just know how to work with numbers. Just, just be able to understand a formula, okay? Uh, second uh, advertisement, any quantitative scientific subject. PhD, nice, top tier university, no real specification. Bottom one, to qualify for this position, you will have, hey, not even a PhD, we'll take a bachelor's, we'll take a master's. From some field, computer science is a good start, um, from a red brick university with some sort of not embarrassing GPA. And these positions all start with salaries of at least 150000 and typically 250000 for junior people. Okay, so this, I mean, I hear screams from employers saying they're desperate to find someone. I mean, otherwise, why would they offer these salaries and be so broad in their net for the search? They're desperate for someone, but meanwhile, these people being graduated with these degrees obviously are not satisfying that need. Why not? Well, I happen to know a vice president of Bank of America, so I gave him a call and said, what is going on here? Because the same guy had called me two years earlier and said, hey, you're working on immigration issues. Have we got a problem? We have advanced mathematicians we can't get in from Russia. So I called him and said, what is going on with this field? And he said, well, look, you know, don't say you got it from me. And in fact, the lawyers at Bank of America won't let me quote him by individual name. But what is happening is that the universities uh, teach a specific formula that has been applied uh, um, in this field. It's a very famous formula. And they teach how to apply it to a number of different situations. So you become an expert in applying this particular formula. But what they don't teach is they don't teach how to arrive at a completely new formula to, uh, to describe a new financial instrument. 
So the ability to actually create a formula that hasn't already been uh, created does not exist in these graduates, and that's what the banks need them to do. If they have some interesting new financial instrument they're thinking of deploying, they need to understand how it's going to behave, what the market's likely to be, um, and that kind of modeling requires very deep understanding of a number of numerical methods and the ability to combine and create them to come up with a model. That model creation ability does not exist among any of the graduates. So because I couldn't quote my friend, I did find someone online who said pretty much the same thing. So here's a guy who's made his living off of consulting for very top financial firms. And he says, it's been very fashionable for universities to offer master's degree programs in this field, uh, which basically means solving this equation in any one of a number of applications. But unless the field reinvents itself to become relevant to what people actually do, which is creating new equations, these people are not going to find jobs, even though they have the right label. Uh, and they're going to wonder what went wrong. You know, I got an A, I have an A average, a great thesis from a brand name university, and I cannot find a job. And to some extent, for better or for worse, actually that's what's happening in some of our fields. The problem is that the dialogue between industry and university is sufficiently vague that nobody can seem to address the problem. Uh, industry will say things like, we need T-shaped people. We need people with 21st century skills. And the university is like, well, should we sign them up for more English classes? You know, how should we adjust our graduation requirements? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dialogue about skills on the industry side, knowledge on the university side, and the two are not necessarily matched. So that's an issue I think that we're struggling with that we haven't really well defined. A second issue that you see commonly in the science policy literature is the dearth of minority scientists and engineers. This is one that many of us have worked on um, ad nauseum for, I don't know, at least the past 20 years. And in fact, we have made almost zilcho progress. Uh, this is the combined black and Hispanic percentage of our STEM graduate uh, or uh, undergraduate departments or those graduating with BS degrees. Uh, about 10 years ago, it was around 10%. Now it's about 13%. So we've budged the dial only slightly. And I would submit to you that most of that increase has been due to an underlying shift in the demographics of the US population, not really any intrinsic gains on the behalf of departmental uh, strategies for attracting more minority students. But what I find really interesting is that there is a model out there that works extremely well for um, captivate, capturing minority students, and that is the NCAA football model. Now, you might think that, well, I mean, this is different, right, somehow? Um, but actually, we're both drawing from the same population. We're both drawing from the high schools, public high schools across the country, OK? So it is not, it's not like our strategy is thinking, OK, if we could only educate those high school teachers better, you know, if they all had bachelor's degrees in science, that would make an improvement. If we only had more outreach to these students, you know, more summer science camps, more, more, you know, invite an exciting lecturer, that would somehow inspire more minority students to come to us. If we only made our curriculum more relevant, you know, if, uh, we only had national standards. So we think of all these ways to sort of change these high schools to get out more minorities into science. These guys aren't changing high schools at all. They're not worried about, you know, the training of the coaches on any sort of grand scale. But what they do that we don't do is they go out and recruit. They send people into high schools and ask the coaches, who are your best players? And they observe those players. They invite those players to a summer camp where they've already lined up recruiters from colleges to go talk to those players, okay? It is a person pull in. Their outreach efforts are all people in, people in. Go out and grab, find the talent, grab that talent, pull it in, pull it in. Ours is a content out approach. Let's put more science out there, more science out there, more science out there, and then wait to see if they come to us. This is a much more effective strategy. If you were looking for a star athlete, if you were looking for a CEO, you would hire a headhunter to go out and get them. You would not sit around and wait for them to come to you. This is a strategy that works. This is a strategy that fails. OK, final example, um, the never-ending postdoc that never leads to a real job. I knew there were going to be postdocs here, so I thought I'd talk, tackle this one. OK, um, I tried, but it was like 3.30 this morning when I put together this talk, so OK, I didn't quite get the most recent statistics because the most recent ones are still in NSF's database and I would have to hire someone to get them out. But uh, the most recently published ones are actually from almost a decade, uh, over a decade ago. Um, but still, at that point in time, if you were in the biological sciences, you were looking at a postdoc, a medium postdoc of four years, which is pretty long. And there are at least a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one has to do with um, uh, immigration and the fact that a postdoc is a holding position for a lot of people looking for green cards, and so you kind of stay there until you can finally get a permanent job. And there have been fairly good uh, models showing that if you either limit the number of foreign students coming in or give them green cards immediately when they graduate, 
then this, this number, this postdoc number, would go way down in terms of the length of duration of a postdoc. But there is another contributor, even for those of us who are uh, born and raised in the U.S., and that is that NIH sees itself um, as, I'm talking here about the postdocs and biological sciences, which are much longer than the physical sciences. NIH sees itself as a trainer for future industry jobs. So we're going to train people up until they can go off and get real jobs, and we'll train them better. In fact, most of their discussions about why we have terminal postdocs is, well, these people aren't really trained well for industry, so we'll change the training somehow. But the fact of the matter is that NIH is the guerrilla employer in this space. If you look at how many biomedical researchers are supported at NIH and universities are employed intramurally versus how many are employed by private industry and then by all other, which includes um, Howard Hughes, it would include Army Medical Research Center, things like that, um, NIH is by far the biggest employer. It is bigger than all of private industry combined. So to sit back and think that, okay, we're training people for this private industry, employers, you are the employer. NIH is the employer. It is the biggest employer out there of biomedical researchers, but it doesn't think of itself as an employer. If it thought of itself as an employer, they would think, be thinking about things like career ladders, benefits, um, you know, how do you, how does an employer, you know, daycare? I mean, there's just like tons of things that employers do that an educator doesn't, okay? Because an education system is a temporary holding system and an employment is sort of a permanent lifetime career system. And so there are many ways that you would actually restructure the way grants uh, are supposed to be are submitted and the way people are funded on grants, uh, the way that you would structure different positions in labs if you thought of NIH as an employer rather than as a, a facilitator of future education. And I don't think NIH really knows this about itself, to be honest. Um, the interesting thing is in the physical sciences, this is very much flipped. So um, NSF provides some fellowships. But the industry piece is huge, huge, huge compared to that, okay? And the reason for that is that the defense money, they go, the defense department supplies tons of money to industry. You have your Martin Mariettas, you have your Boeings, and that, those industries are the ones that then hire people. So the government money is actually hiring people, but it goes through private industry. Very different model. Okay, that's it for me.